what's up everybody? It's Jess Evans here. I just want to take a second to uh, do a little talking head video for you guys to kind of give you a heads up about some, uh, some different items that I personally feel like are must have in any kind of outdoor survival scenario. Minimalist materials right here. We're not thinking comfort, long-term survivability. We're thinking what do I want to have in my pack just in case I have to stay a few nights, maybe possibly a week out there wherever I'm stranded out. Uh, not to get much room, obviously. I don't want to dedicate my entire pack for these items. I want something that's very small, it's lightweight. I can use it for multiple items, and it's uh, ultimately my necessities to get me back out of that situation, back home with my family members, and hopefully, you know, have a fun story to talk about after the fact. So, why, why should you care? That's always a question I ask whenever I'm watching these videos. Uh, my, my experience is I'm a full-time survival instructor, also an outdoor, avid outdoorsman. I love going outdoors. Uh, hunting, fishing, anything out there with my family, my friends, and uh, kind of get myself in these long wilderness remote situations where maybe possibly I could get in trouble, but I hopefully am going to be prepared for that. Uh, worst case scenario is I'm that survival guy that uh, has to tell a story about how I had troubles out there and stayed night in the, and out in the outdoors when I wasn't planning on it. But if everything goes right and I'm going to pay attention to stuff I pack with me, that shouldn't be an issue. So six categories for items that you should think about to make sure you have packed in your, your kit whenever you go outdoors to the wilderness situation. Starting out with the first one, uh, I've always wanted to plan on getting myself out of that situation as fast as I possibly can. I don't want to stay in night out there. I don't want to be out there longer than I have to be. So something that's really going to help you out is having the ability to reach out to somebody, get rescue started up, and hopefully they're going to come out there, pick you up, and now you just got to tell a funny story. So there's a lot of different options out there for you. First one is getting out some kind of distress call, whether that be a beacon, a sat phone. Uh, I'm a huge fan of the InReach, which is a new device they start out with. It's basically a text message that you can send out anywhere in the world. It gives them an updated GPS signal where I'm located. I'll have a distress call along with that. There's no question about where I'm at. It's gonna get a signal out there. They're gonna have GPS location on you. So hopefully you hit that button, you tell them you're in trouble. Within a few hours, they're hopefully picking you up. And then you just gotta smile on the face of the guy that's grabbing you and bringing you home. Uh, so that's ideal, an in-reach or some kind of ability to reach out there. Sat phones, especially in Alaska, these are kind of a joke in a lot of ways. If I'm not next to a road system or next to, next to a major town or city or anything like that, these probably aren't going to work. Uh, however, this is pretty useful if I'm trying to use it as a way to navigate, maybe find myself back to a major civilization or a line of communication like a road or, or waterway or something like that. Uh, one of the apps I like to use, just uh, for your reference here, is called uh, Topo Maps. I'll show you that here on the little picture here as well. It was $15 if I remember right. You don't have to update the maps like that and like that. You don't have to pay for every all the maps, but it has a great way to navigate. It's it's got some uh, it's got GPS coordinates available to you. Can you actually get your exact location on this? It'll track your movements. It'll give you estimated distances. It's a great feature. Downside is uh, it's not the most accurate all the time. It might show you in one location on this map, but you can tell you're not on. Maybe you're on a river and it's telling you you're on the bank 100 meters or whatever the case is. So it's got kind of small differences there. But otherwise it's, otherwise, it's a great app here. And definitely, if you know how to navigate, it'll help you out there. But having some way of getting your signal out there, let the rescue process start. The other one is to uh, actually mark your exact location. This is one of the, the best daytime signals available out there. This is what we're always preaching, harping on, because it can be seen a long distance under the light or under the right conditions. Uh, it's going to be seen up to 100 miles away in the optimum conditions here. So obviously you need to have the sunlight out. Uh, overcast day is possibly going to work, but obviously the ideal way is to have the sunlight out. And this is just going to direct that reflection out to that aircraft, the, the plane flying overhead, or if you see a car a long ways off or something like that, you need to get their attention. You just flash them real fast. And I'll do some more videos on how to actually use this stuff later on. So make sure that rescue effort is able to pick you up. So having a way to do that. This is obviously just the tip of the iceberg. There's a bunch of different options out there uh, that we'll talk about later on, and I'll give you some more options as far as things that work in that area here. The second one is if I'm planning on staying out there long term, I want to be able to go ahead and get myself some kind of comfort item. I can use it for cooking. I can use it for melting wa melting snow into water. I can signal with this thing. It's got great different resources. Obviously, obviously you go to your heat source, your fires. So. They make all kinds of different fire starting devices out there. These are called metal matches or magnesium sticks. I'm a huge fan of these here. A uh, reason being is they burn extremely hot uh, and they also have many, many fires in just a little magnesium uh, ferrous rod like this. Uh, they're not, they're pretty inexpensive. I can get them all over Amazon for uh, fairly cheap, five, ten dollars. Uh, one of my favorites one just for starting out is uh, called Fire Steel or Light My Fire is the brand on this one here. Uh, it's also got the built-in striker uh, and obviously you can get 
three, four thousand fires out of this one stick right here. If I have a heavier duty one, obviously it's countless uh, Obviously on that one. I'm probably going to lose this thing before I use it up. So it's definitely a good one to have out in that situation as well. I'm not a big fan of matches, personally. They work great, don't get me wrong. You definitely get a fire going with a match, especially the stormproof ones. There are all kinds of different versions out there. Problem is you have a limited number. So I, if I'm trying to stay out there long term, uh, and I have to build a fire for whatever reason every single day, or maybe something happens where my fire goes out, I'm not paying attention, I don't have to use up those matches. I don't have to worry about getting ruined and everything else. If this stick gets wet, all you do is dry it off, get it some air on there, put it in my pocket for a little while, and it's good to go once again. All right. Try not to do that, obviously, because these things will react with water, start to pit out a little bit, which causes problems, but not a big deal. Just take care of them. Uh, if I'm going to go with a lighter, I usually go with some kind of butane torch lighter. I'm not, I, I, those big lighters, the cheap ones you find at the grocery, the grocery stores or the gas stations, they work great if you keep them warm in your pockets. Up here in Alaska, 20, 30 below, the first time you strike that thing, that, that thing's going to pop apart in your hand and explode on you. So definitely not a, a long-term survival lighting uh, way right there. All right, so these are kind of just some different ones to pay attention to, to there for uh, lighting your fires. Uh, there's a million different ways you can get a fire going. We'll talk about those all in future videos there. I plan on doing a whole survival series here with every single video we'll kind of dedicate to something else. Uh, but So those are fire, starting situ uh, fire starters. Having some kind of tinder available, whether it be trioxine, which is a chemical means. You've also got all these kind of different fire uh, quick starts, uh, little wicks. You get the wet fire, which is another commercially uh, procured one off the shelf there. You've got the fire sticks, the logs themselves, just kind of a, a basic tinder. Having some way in your pack to start a fire quickly is ideal. Maybe I fall through the ice. Maybe I'm in a situation where I'm going hypothermic. I need to get a fire going right away. I don't want to sit there messing around with finding natural tenders and all that kind of stuff. And maybe uh, getting a situation where my hands no longer function because I'm getting so cold. I want to have the ability to get a fire going right away with very minimal thought and uh, hopefully have a great success situation going on right there. And I can progress on the other stuff. So one thing that's going to help you, obviously having the ability to break down wood or butcher animals is going to be important. So I always like to always have a knife of some kind on me. Every survivalist out there should always have a plethora of knives all over the place. These things get uh, are, are invaluable, I would say here. So depending on the situation, is uh, it depends on which kind of knife you're going for. I like to personally have like a little folding pocket knife in my pocket at all times, just a small, minute, detailed uh, job I might be working on out there. But more importantly, if I can only have one knife, it'd be some kind of fixed blade, about six to seven inches or so. I like this because it's fairly, you can machete with it fairly easy. You can split down wood with it pretty easily. You can butcher uh, a large game animal fairly easy with this thing. They're very uh, tough and indestructible and there's a million different reasons I can, a million different ways I can use this. I, this right here will do majority of the jobs that this guy is going to do here. So going to the larger fixed blade, if I had to choose one or the other for some reason, that's the, definitely the route I'd go right there. Uh, different types of knives are obviously going to have different types of metals. This is a Damascus steel one. It's just a fancy knife. If I'm going for just a all-around utilitarian knife, I'm looking at like a tool, a tool steel type of knife. I'm a big fan of cold steel. Those work great. The SRK uh, is a great knife right there. Uh, the RAT series are all great. The ESS or SE. Survival knives are also great. It's really just a preference item on which ones you think are going to work well for you. One thing to pay attention to though, depending on the temperatures you're running to out there, you really got to focus on what kind of steel or pay attention to what kind of steel you're going to be working with. If it's a knife that's really hard, it's got a hard temper to it, when it's 40, 50 below, these things will snap apart and break on you. That's happened to me four, more than a few times. So a nice, just a tool steel, like I was saying, is just an all around great utilitarian type knife. They don't hold a blade or an edge nearly as long as like a hardened, a uh, more high-end knife, but they tend not to snap and break on you nearly as often. But have some kind of cutting tool on you uh, is, is obviously going to be important there. From there, I obviously want to make sure I'm staying hydrated while out there. So this, I always bring with me some kind of metal container, whether it be a clean canteen, some, like a pot, uh, a little can with a, a metal can that I can heat up somehow. And it's kind of a, a, a two-fold item here. I want to be able to hold the water, be able to hydrate while I'm out there, but I also want to be able to go ahead and procure that water and purify is a part of this. A lot of people don't think about this when you're in the wilderness, but there's two different ways you can kind of pre prepare your water. You can filter it, which is just getting rid of the big chunks, like maybe there's an insect or bark or grass or something like that in there. Or, and the other part of it is going to be purifying it. Purifying is actually going to kill off those microorganisms, bacteria, and viruses that are in that water source, and it's going to prevent you from getting sick. A Jardia is a really common one we run into. I've seen more than a few folks get that. It's a nasty, nasty little bug you get in your system there, and it's going to cause you to kind of expel all of your liquids in your body. 
and you imagine yourself in a survival scenario where it's bad enough, you're kind of a hard time. Last thing you want to be dealing with is getting dehydrated and uh, and causing more more aggravation because you drank unpurified water. So I want to be able to store the water, but I also want to be able to purify it. One of the best ways to purify water, the most reliable ways to purify water, is going to be boiling it. There's a ton of chemical means out there: bleach, uh, iodine tabs. Uh, you name it, UV, just putting it out in the sun. We'll talk about all this in, in depth later on, but one of the best ways to purify your water is going to be to boil it for at least one minute and leave it covered for, for a little while afterwards. Once it's at a rolling boil, it's above that threshold where it's going to kill off all those microorganisms and then therefore it's going to be safe to drink. Uh, there's some factors in there depending on what altitude you're at and everything else, but if you look at the the World Health Organization charts for what uh, temperature different microbes die at, uh, usually about 180, a little over 180 is going to be good to go, which anything below 15, 20,000 feet in elevation, a uh, boiling point is going to be well above that 180 right there. So get it to a rolling boil. I like to leave it covered just a little bit longer just to make sure I'm good to go. The other part of this is if I have any kind of water trapped around the local area, I don't want to make sure that's like trapped in the seals of my containers or anything like that. So if I use a chemical means, like I throw some bleach in there or throw some iodide in this canteen, I gotta think about what's trapped in the threads right here. If I got some non-purified water in the threads, everything below it is good to go, but that's not purified in the threads here. When you first open this thing and get a drink out of it, invert that, open it up just a little bit and let some of that water kind of peel out of that lid there and now make sure you get rid of all that, uh, all the, the nasty bacteria and microbes and everything else that's in there. Uh, all it takes is for one little guy to get past your system and you're in your system and you're going to give you a hard time out there. So make sure you get rid of all that as much as you possibly can. So boiling is going to be ideal. Other ways you can do it, obviously I talked about like the mic the Aquapira or Aquamira tabs here. These are great. I'm kind of a fan of these and not the most reliable as far as the, the literature goes. I've had never had a problem with them. Uh, I do like the fact that they don't really taste these as nearly as much as like an iodine or a bleach. Bleach, just your off the shelf stuff right here, Clorox. I go with unscented personally, but definitely uh, it will help out as well as far as killing off those, those uh, back type bacteria and everything else. It's two drops per quart for the bleach. Iodine, it usually is two tablets per quart. Uh, with the aqua mirror, just pay attention to the instructions. Some are in dropper form, some are in tablet form, so you gotta pay attention to what you're supposed to be using those. But also keep in mind, extreme cold temperatures, these, these processes here for actually killing off and, and coating the microbes, it will take a little bit longer. So if, for example, if it says for it to take 30 minutes in the package here, I'll give at least you know 45 to an hour just to make sure I'm good to go there and have to worry about possibly you know, ingesting one of those nasty bugs into my system right there. So, so far we've talked about getting a signal out there, getting yourself a fire, staying warm, having a way to kind of make a fire, butcher an animal, Obviously, you're staying hydrated with our water sources, with our actual metal containers here, which are more ideal here. And the last one's going to be actually navigating your way out of that situation or being able to relay your location to somebody else that might be on their way to come pick you up. So what I always like to preach is some kind of map and a compass. Our lensetic compasses, there's a dime dozen out there. There's all kinds of silver compasses that are out there. These things are fairly inexpensive. They take a little bit of technique to work with. Well, once again, I'll show you another video on how to use those. Uh, but obviously a map of the local area you're gonna be in. Uh, there's a bunch of different ways you can get a hold of these. There's a bunch of different websites out there. You can just log on, get, update your location you can be working out of, and you can actually print off right there the different uh, maps you want to work with. A lot of them are obviously at a cost, so obviously you have to think about that and make sure you're covering the area you're going to go with. With the maps, I don't want something that's a large area, something that's like a topo map, something that uh, an airplane is going to fly with. They cover a large area. They can cover the half of the state of Alaska here, uh, but I want to be able to have a specific 1 to 50,000 scale topo map that I can use for navigating on the ground. The difference is it's going to be a smaller area that's covering, but I'm going to have a lot more detail for me when I'm walking on the ground. It's going to be different elevations, it's going to give me different roads, jeep trails, any kind of man-made or natural land features are out there. It's going to be very helpful for me for identifying where I'm at, uh, giving my location out there and everything else. Uh, these ones are MGRS, which stands for Military Grid Reference System. It's just a nice way to get, figure out your coordinates, to be able to relay those systems. It's, it's very accurate if you are com com comfortable with using this. A lot of people, ground navigators, we use these because it's more of a more user-friendly system versus using like a latitude, longitude type coordinate setup. Especially if all I have is a map and I don't have like a GPS, it's going to give me my, my readout. Which brings me to the GPSs. There's a bunch of them out there. These are 
great tools that work very well under most situations. However, realize that these here are going to potentially fail a lot more frequently than like a map and compass would. If I have a map, I'm able to read that thing fairly well. I can use cardinal direction to get navigate. I don't necessarily have to have a compass. Uh, we'll talk about that more in detail. However, GPSs, they're battery operated devices, electronics, which I'm out in the wilderness set setting. It might be extremely cold out, below, well below freezing for me in my situations typically. Uh, these batteries aren't gonna last as long. The LCD screen is gonna crystallize and break on you. Uh, not to mention, uh, once this thing is dead, I don't have the ability to produce more batteries typically. Uh, so I don't necessarily just wanna rely on this for navigating. Don't get me wrong, this is a great tool to use if I have plenty of batteries, maybe I, uh, I'm not in a survival setting, I just wanna be able to navigate, uh, I wanna be able to mark exact locations out there, uh, I wanna be able to pull up my exact location, read the coordinates off, and then turn this thing off, save the batteries, and go back to my map that I'll possibly be working with. So definitely kinda of goes hand in hand. Map and compass is more reliable, I would say, under a survival setting versus a GPS. Uh, this is not gonna be as reliable, it's gonna eat some batteries, and it's very, it's very difficult to update your your uh, exact location as you're walking. In fact, a lot of the different GPSs out there, they require you to have this thing on and for you to be walking before it'll update your different headings that you're walking on. So therefore, you end up doing this zigzag as you're trying to manipulate this thing back and forth because it works off of you and updating your coordinate directions as you kind of leapfrog down that line there. So also obviously a great resource. Another problem we run into with using uh, GPS is this far north in latitude is this is uh it's very hard to get satellite coverage with these that's a very kind of a shoddy service we have a lot of mountain ranges that are kind of impeding with our signals and everything else uh, and it usually takes us a little bit longer to get a hold of a good signal on these guys versus down there at the equator down there in the lower 48 states even it's a lot it's a lot harder up here as well and that brings me to the very last uh category which we don't really talk about which is a some kind of medical kit uh, there's a bunch of different ones out there. It doesn't have to be necessarily the hot, best one out there. It could be anything you buy, like REI, off the shelf kind of store. Uh, as long as they have just the basics in there, as far as like band-aids, bandages, gauze, tape material. Uh, and also a lot of those different off the shelf medical kits, they already have a lot of good medications built into them already. As far as like pain reliever, a Benadryl, if you have some kind of allergic reaction, um, moleskin, which is that, uh, it's kind of material put over blisters. Uh, to keep it from puncture or popping as you're walking along and everything else. That way you can still navigate and get yourself out of the situation. So these things are fairly robust already, kind of built up, and they have a nice little checklist of everything that's inside of those. For 99% of the stuff that we you typically run into or a wilderness person is going to run into, that's going to do the job for you. The only areas where I would focus on with your medical uh, need is going to be what you specifically need. For example, if I have an individual that is uh, allergic to bees, for example, uh, I'm going to be thinking about some kind of EpiPen, an epinephrine pen. Uh, that way, if they have some, they go into anaphylactic shock or have some kind of reaction from getting stung or or, a, or a, any kind of reaction to a plant, and maybe their airway is starting to close off, they're having a systemic reaction. I want to be able to go ahead and use that EpiPen, get them that injection real fast, and then I want to get them out of that situation as fast as they possibly can. So that's something that will definitely save your life, especially if you have somebody that's alert to things like bees and everything else that you might run into out there. The other one you want to take a look at is going to be some kind of way to stop major blood flow. And over the years, we've kind of played with this just a little bit as far as our teachings and what we feel are, is the most practical under survival scenario. Obviously, we're thinking wilderness survival, not higher care with you're in a, a medical scenario right there. We got downtown, you got a doctor working on you. That's completely different. We're talking wilderness survival right now. So the other thing I want to think about is some kind of way to stop major blood flow. A tourniquet is a great resource for that. We used to be talking about, we used to talk about constriction bandages and the benefits of those we found is kind of skip that step. If you got a major bleeder out, maybe your arteries kind of severed, partially severed, and you got some major blood flowing out wherever it might be, having the ability to get that tourniquet on there, tighten that thing down, stop that blood flow, and then go ahead and treat that injury as best you can. Try to possibly stop that blood, or if it's not, you're not too far away from rescue, you might as well just leave that thing on there and get yourself out of that situation until you're in higher. Uh, medical care there, a higher level of medical care, and they can hopefully treat that and uh, get you back to 100% right there. But I want to be able to stop that blood flow right away. Band-Aids, obviously, you're not going to cut it in that scenario. If i got a serious artery, arterial bleed going on, I, I can't last very long. So I want to stop that blood flow as quickly as I possibly can. That way it gets me out of that scenario. I'm hopefully walking out of there uh, and uh, hopefully making it back to civilization and back to rescue. 
Uh, just kind of a finer note on that one, we always like to emphasize if you put a tourniquet on somebody, uh, make sure that you document or annotate that somehow. So, so for example, if I personally got injured, I threw a tourniquet on somewhere that's not readily available, I would like to want to make sure I mark on my body somewhere where if somebody else showed up on scene, they'd be able to see that I have a tourniquet on and, and I obviously figured out when I had that thing on. I'm not getting too in the weeds with it, but you know, if you have a tourniquet on for five minutes versus five hours, there's a huge difference there as far as survivability if you should in fact release that tourniquet because you're going to be ingesting or circulating uh, toxins everything else from your blood breaking down and everything else. So I'm not going to get in the weeds with that one, but I'll have the ability to go ahead and communicate to whoever is there rescuing you that you do in fact have a tourniquet on and what time, what day you put that thing on yourself. So mark a T on their forehead with a date time stamp is the best way to go about it, but have some way to go ahead and document that. Maybe a stamp or maybe like a note or something like that you might put on your person. So just to recap real fast, six areas I want to make sure I have whenever I go out on a survival wilderness outing. Thinking minimalist once again, I don't want to come for comfort here, something to keep me alive. First one is going to be going to get your signal, getting some kind of signal out there to get rescue started, to get you picked up. If I'm picked up in two hours, I don't have to worry about the rest of my needs here necessarily, hopefully in the right scenario. Uh, it's obviously not going to be, it's obviously situational dependent on that one. But anything from, you know, a cell phone, depending on the area you're in, a satellite phone, an in reach. These are the spot devices. I don't really talk about these much. I'll go over more of that in detail. But this is a great commercial off the shelf option for you as well. Uh, and then also having some way of going and marking your location, exact location. A signal mirror is the best daytime signal out there. It can be seen over 100 miles away in the right scenario. And that's just the tip of the iceberg for signaling stuff. There's a plethora of other things I'll talk about later in future videos. Next one, you got your, your fire starting devices, your fire source. So magnesium ferrule rods here are a great option for you. And I'll link some options for those, where to buy those. Amazon's a great resource. There are all kinds of different ones out there. Uh, also, you got the you know the butane torches, great option. You can use matches. We talked about that, and that's a great option for you under the right situations. And it's your your preference at that point. Me personally, I don't go that route. It's for obviously we talked about for those other reasons there. Uh, getting some way to get a tinder gun or a fire gun with a tinder here. So trioxine, wet fires, a lot of commercial devices you can buy off the shelf. Fire paste is one I have here in front of me right now. That's a great resource for you as well. Uh, fire logs as well as the uh, tender quick tabs here, those will burn fairly well. Once again, plenty of options there. We'll talk about more of those. That's just the tip of the iceberg as well. The other one's gonna be some kind of knife or cutting tool. I like, once again, if I had to choose one, I'd go with a bigger version of uh, the fixed blade knives there, just because it has a lot more utilitarian use for it. And I can still kind of use a big knife the same way I could use a little knife with skinny actions. It's not ideal, but I can definitely get by with that there. Having some kind of water device, storage device is going to be ideal here. So a metal one, obviously that cap is uh, not going to be on that in this scenario if I'm going to be uh, heating it up or melting snow with that thing or purifying water. But having the ability to carry water in a metal container, that way I can purify water, I can melt down the snow, I have a, a nice pure source of snow available through it as well. But in conjunction with that, some way of purifying that is going to be ideal as well. Bleach, pure, uh, chemical tabs, iodine, uh, aquamira, uh, UV, and there's a bunch of, once again, there's a plenty of different areas that you can take care of purifying. We'll talk about that in depth as well. Having some way of getting yourself out of that situation is going to be ideal. So a mat, a compass, silva, a lensatic, that way this stuff will never fail on you. You're going to be able to walk with it long term, navigate with it in detail if you get the appropriate map, which like I said, I go with a one to 50 thousandths a topo map for walking on the ground. It's got more detail there. Uh, but it's going to give me the ability to go ahead and navigate to a location, hopefully get myself rescued. Plan doing a plenty more videos on how to read a map, how to work with a compass, all that kind of stuff later on. And the last one was your medical needs. So um, off the shelf medical kits, ideal. It's got a lot of different uh, bandages and options and gauze and tapes and everything else that's in there. It covers a majority of your needs you might run into while you're out there walking around. It's also got some medications to think about as far as your pain relievers, Got the Benadryl. A couple areas we talked about though, you want to make sure and focus on though, is if you have any alerts reaction, if you're alert to certain items, an EpiPen is going to be ideal. Have one of those, a couple of those on your body ready to go. Uh, also a tourniquet, uh, having the ability to stop major blood flow. Uh, once we talked about it as well, you can bleed out within four minutes of a major artery uh, severance. So just having the ability to stop that blood flow, get yourself walking out of there back to civilization and then hopefully they'll be able to treat that long term and uh, save that limb. And then obviously if you bleed out in four minutes, 
the rest just isn't a necessity anymore. So definitely take a look at that and make sure you have the ability to stop that blood flow and get yourself treated medically. So that's all I got for you for now. I know it's just tip of the iceberg. You got a ton of questions out there and I plan to do a lot more uh, coverage of this and we're kind of diving into each one of these different needs here and kind of breaking it down a little bit more for you. Uh, also talk about some of the nicety type items that might want to consider packing like on a, a, a hunting trip or an outdoor wilderness ex excursion where you're out there for days away from any kind of civilization. What are some things that you want to bring to kind of make that more enjoyable for you? I got plenty more stuff like talk about that later on on a separate video. So if you like this, please give me a thumbs up. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Uh, I throw a comment down in that comment box. I try to answer as many questions as I possibly can. So go ahead and type those up and I'll do my best to get back to you and answer those questions. And it also kind of jog my memory for more items that I want to go ahead and go over as far as videos for survival, wilderness events and everything else. So definitely we'll get all the information out to you as much as I possibly can. My goal here is to get all the information out to you so if you go out there, enjoy the wilderness, you're not scared about a bad situation happening. In fact, you're going to be able to master that situation, get back to civilization and have an awesome story you can tell your friends and family and possibly get yourself that little book deal later on, depending on you know, how important it is and everything else. So uh, without, without further ado, please uh, like, comment, and su subscribe. Give me that thumbs up, and uh, I will see you guys on the next video. All right, appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm.